Okay, as we have already discussed in this class, the planetary gear sets, like we're, we are looking at here for this Allison 1000 transmission, are the heart and the, the meat, the, the guts of the automatic transmission. And as we've discussed in the previous video, we have clutch packs that come in that connect the engine to pieces of the planetary gear sets and then we have clutch packs that stop pieces of the planetary gear set from rotating. Now, those pieces that stop the pieces of the planetary gear sets from rotating are called clutches, but in some manuals they are called brakes because they stop the pieces from rotating. So if you ever hear me call something a brake, that's what I'm referring to. It, it will stop. A piece of a planetary gear set. So right here next to the Allison transmission we have a Toyota front-wheel drive six-speed transmission as far as the planetary gear sets. This has three planetary gear sets inside of it to get six forward speeds. Um, right behind us here on the bench we have a four-speed transmission that has two planetary gear sets in the back because it's an old three-speed and then one planetary gear set in the front because they threw in an overdrive gear set to make it into a four-speed uh, later on. Uh, if we come over here and look over on the far table there that is the gear stack up from a Chrysler 48RE automatic transmission. And it's an old three-speed transmission in the front with an overdrive unit stuck in the back to make it a four-speed. Uh, the pieces in the front there that look like they're wrapping around the shiny silver pieces, those are called bands. And instead of clutch packs stopping those pieces from rotating, they use bands to stop those pieces. Now if we were here meeting face to face in class I would have one of you get that out and show it to me but as you can see it's buried and I cannot get to it. Uh, right here this particular stack of, of gears we have four sets of planetary gears here but this is only a six-speed transmission from a Toyota Tundra pickup truck but it operates the same way. We have clutches in the top that rotate and connect to the engine and then we have brakes that stop pieces from rotating in the rear. Right here in the back we have an 8-speed Lexus trans transmission with planetary gear sets and clutches that do the, the, the clutches do the rotating and the holding. Here's another 8-speed uh, Toyota transmission right here. Uh, right here on the bench is an old 3-speed automatic transmission. And it also has clutches and bands and planetary gear sets to provide the different gear ratios needed. And then if we come over here. Here is a front-wheel drive transaxle, an 8-speed front-wheel drive transaxle that General Motors and Toyota both use. And it has four planetary gear sets in a real compact, uh, small housing, uh, but it still gives us eight speeds. This is an 8-speed front-wheel drive transaxle. And then right over here is an 8-speed General Motors. A transmission that has all the guts stacked up inside of it as far as the planetary gear sets are concerned. And then if we come right over here, right here we have the Ford, they call it the 10R80 automatic transmission. This is a 10-speed transmission and stacked up right here inside of this housing here are four planetary gear sets and it also has clutch packs that 
do the stopping or holding of pieces from rotating as well as applying power from the engine to give us 10 gear ratios uh, forward plus a reverse gear ratio. Now, right here on the workbench, I have, tilt the camera down so you can see it a little bit, I have six clutch packs, six sets of clutches uh, here. They're labeled the A, B, C, D, E, and F clutches here in this 10-speed uh, Ford transmission. And some of these do the stopping or the braking, the holding of pieces of the planetary gear sets. Some of them do the rotating. So we've talked about planetary gear set operation and how that works. But today I want to spend a little time talking about the actual clutch packs themselves. And then we'll start looking at the valve body. Here's a valve body for this 10 speed transmission. And as you can see here, we have a whole bunch of solenoids on the side and a couple more on the back over here. Some of these solenoids are just solenoids that are on or off. Some of them are a variable solenoid. They are called or they are controlled with something called pulse width modulation. And so we have an electrical connector right here that the wiring harness connects to the transmission controller uh, to control these solenoids. These solenoids control valves inside of the valve body. Those valves route hydraulic fluid from the oil pump to the clutch packs to hold or drive different pieces of the planetary gear set. So every transmission has some sort, every automatic transmission has some sort of a valve body. Here's one for this front wheel drive eight speed. Here's one for this rear wheel drive eight speed. They all have a lot of common components. They all operate very similarly to each other and we are going to learn about those as well. Okay, we are looking at the A clutch pack, B clutch pack, C, D, E, and F. Six clutch packs that came out of the Ford 10R80 10-speed transmission right here. One of these clutch packs is a brake. This one right here, the, the B clutch. It's, it is a clutch pack that stops a piece of the planetary gear set from rotating. The rest of these are clutches. And of course, B is a clutch also, but it stops something from rotating. So I'm going to call it a brake for now on. The rest of these are clutches, which means when they apply, they will allow something to start rotating. Okay, so all of these clutch packs have several things in common with each other. So let's take a look at this A clutch pack to begin with. First thing I want you to notice is that it has a really thick, heavy, what's called a backing plate. And notice it has a really flat, smooth surface on one side and then not a flat surface on the other side. Although sometimes it could be flat on both sides. Um, you want to use, you want to find the, the side of the heavy plate, the backing plate, that is the smoothest to allow an actual clutch disc that I've got here to be sandwiched in between. To rub against. So this is a clutch disc. Notice this particular clutch disc has teeth on the inside here where my fingers are and so it's going to go around something that has splines around the outside of it and it's going to rotate with that part. Now next 
to that, we have a steel plate. And notice the the steel plate is flat on both sides, and it has teeth right here by my thumb around the outside edge. And so if we look closely at this clutch pack here, we have steel plates with teeth on the outside, fiber plates with teeth on the inside, and we alternate steel fiber, steel fiber, steel fiber, all the way through to the bottom. So turn all these over and set them right here. And then at the bottom here, we have what's called the apply plate. And it's a big thick steel plate also. The apply plate and the backing plate, this other big thick steel plate right on the top of the clutch pack here. I want you to think of those as like a sandwich where you take two pieces of bread and we've got the thick apply plate and the thick backing plate and then the the internal plates in between, the smaller plates, the, the fiber plates and the steel plates. Notice this one has three fiber plates and two small uh, steel plates in between and then the two larger thick plates on the outside there. So when this clutch pack applies, something is going to come in and squish these together. And when it squishes them together, it forces them to turn at the same speed. So this whole house, or this whole assembly of clutch discs will rotate together. And the part that does the squishing or the applying of this clutch pack is called the clutch piston. So there's some sort of a piston, like a piston in an uh, engine, that is going to move forward with hydraulic pressure and squish those together. So I've got a transmission case right here, a transaxle case, uh, and in the bottom of this transaxle case I have the B2 brake piston, as you can see right down there. I've got a label, B2 brake piston. And so this whole piece right here, that whole piece is a clutch piston. and these pistons have uh, what are called return springs. So if we come in close there, you can see some springs down in there that push the piston, push the piston to the released position once it is applied hydraulically. And so what I'd like to do is apply that piston. Now normally that piston is applied by a valve in the valve body a valve that has hydraulic pressure applied to it and when the valve moves out of the way that fluid can go through and that let's see that was called the B2 brake piston notice there's a passage that I've identified right here called the B2 brake passage and those holes right there and all of these holes right here connect to the bottom of this valve body. So these, these holes right here connect to these holes and all these holes along the bottom there connect to all of these holes. So what I'm going to do is instead of putting hydraulic uh, pressurized fluid into the B2 uh, brake passage, I'm going to take some compressed air and blow in there instead. So, let me grab a compressed air hose right here. You guys have used these in my previous classes. So I'm going to come in and hit air, compressed air, to that passage. Whoops, sorry. Moving the camera all over. So I'm going to come in right here and blow some air into there. And at the same time, we are going to watch this piston. We're going to watch it move. 
See that come forward, and then it pushes back. So it comes forward because of the pressure, hydraulic pressure, and then it goes back. Let me come in a better side view here. And it goes back because of the spring pressure of those return springs. And so that is one example of a clutch piston. Well, for, for every one of these clutch packs, there's a clutch piston. That clutch piston pushes on the apply plate, this really thick plate down below, and then this backing plate, the real thick heavy one on the back, it's held in with snap rings inside of the transmission and it doesn't move. And so then that allows the bottom, that clutch piston to come in underneath and squish all of these together. Now I've got a, a few more clutch pistons I'll show you over here. So here is a clutch piston here, here, here. All four of those are clutch pistons. All four of them have their own return springs that push them back to the released position once the hydraulic pressure uh, is gone. And so here's a clutch pack or clutch piston right here. It would just move, move up with hydraulic pressure, move back down with the return spring force pushing on it. And as it moves up and down, it squishes alternating steel fiber, steel fiber clutch plates together to either start something rotating or in the cases of these larger uh, brake clutches, stop something from rotating. And so we have clutch pistons with some sort of Here's the pistons with some sort of a return spring to push them back to the released positions. If we go back over here to this 10-speed Ford, it has six sets of clutch pistons, or six sets of clutch plates, which means it has six clutch pistons internally, and each one of these clutch packs is applied pretty much the same way. We have a clutch piston that pushes, pushes against the spring and squishes all those together. Now you'll notice here also that on these clutches this particular one only has three fiber plates and two steel plates in between the apply plate and the backing plate. Notice this one has even more. It has one, two, three, four steel plates in between the apply plate and the backing plate which means it has five fiber plates. This one here has a different number. This one has even more. And the others are very similar. And as you can see from a top view, some of these are pretty small in diameter, and some of these are pretty large in diameter. And so the larger diameter ones actually have a whole bunch of surface area. If you add up all that surface area because of its large diameter, it may take in this smaller clutch, it might take two of these smaller clutch discs to give us the same surface area as one of the larger ones. And so what I'm saying is even though this clutch right here has less plates in it, it can be just as strong or stronger than one that has a smaller diameter and more plates. And so they just uh, adjust how many steel fiber, steel fiber, steel fiber uh, plates they have. Um, I've set the snap rings that hold the backing plates in place on top of most of these. Uh, some of them uh, uh, I've moved to another location, but uh, another thing I want to show you is that's kind of unique to this transmission. 
uh, is that there are some additional, look at this wavy looking round spring here. This sits right on the steel plate itself and sits around the outside of the fiber plate. And when that is all installed properly, if we stack all these together here, all of those little wavy springs force the steel plates to separate from each other. In other words, to put a little bit of a gap in between. And that gap allows the fiber plates to spin inside of the steel plates when they're not applied and hopefully without rubbing and causing them to uh, wear down prematurely. Because in other clutch packs, if the clutch is not applied, let me get one of these springs out of the way here, we have the steel, a steel plate, the, the fiber plate, and then another steel plate. We don't want the fiber plate rubbing on the inside of the steel plate as it rotates a different speed or direction than the steel plates. A lot of times these steel plates are, don't rotate at all. They're just splined right into the case of the transmission. Um, and so that means they, they're stopped while the fiber plate rotates inside of them. So all of these little wavy springs here help give that fiber plate some gap so it can rotate. Now there's another thing I wanted to show you at the bottom of all of this stack up here. This is called a waved plate. Notice it is not flat. It, it's it's kind of wavy and a lot of clutch packs have a wavy spring in there, a wavy plate as a it, it acts as a cushion so when the piston comes and pushes on the clutch pack to apply it, it has to smash or squish this wavy spring plate and that acts as a cushion for or a shock absorber for the clutch as it applies. And you'll find something like that in almost every uh, clutch pack that you come across. All right, so there's different styles, different sizes of clutch packs, clutch plates but they all do the same two things. They either stop one of the pieces of a planetary gear set from rotating, or they force one of the pieces of a planetary gear set to rotate. And in a transmission like this 10 speed here, where we have four planetary gear sets inside of there, um, which parts they're stopping, which parts they're rotating, uh, is going to vary greatly depending on which of the 10 forward gears, gear ratios, uh, we want to uh, have available while driving. Okay, the next thing I want to show you are things called one-way devices. So this is a one-way device, this is a one-way device, there's another one I'll show you here in a minute. Uh, a one-way device 
is a part that will rotate in one direction but not the other. Now when you learned about how a torque converter works, you learned that there was a part called the stator. And the stator had a one-way device connected to it, hooking it to the stator support shaft that allowed it to rotate in one direction only. So this particular type of one-way device is called a sprag. And if you look closely at the, the little keys that are in there, they're pointed to one direction. And if I hold this inside race from turning, I can rotate the outside race counterclockwise as viewed as we're viewing it. But if I try to rotate it the other way, it won't rotate. And if I slide out that inside race, and take the little sprag cage out, you can see that it has these little almost peanut shell shaped pieces that flop from one side to the other. And as they flop in one direction, they get smaller and allow the outer race to rotate. But if we flop them in the other direction, they get taller and it wedges in place and prevents the two pieces from, or prevents the outer piece from rotating uh, with respect to the inner piece. Now, one thing you need to be real careful of with sprags is that if you take one apart to inspect it and you inspect the inner cage area to make sure it's not scarred up um, on both sides there, uh, when you put it back together, you need to make sure that it still rotates only in the direction that it was intended to rotate in. <laughs> if you put one together backwards, uh, the, the vehicle may not move at all, or it'll get to a certain gear and it'll feel like it shifted into neutral. So why do we have one-way uh, devices? One-way devices allow for shifting the transmission from one gear to the next without having to go to neutral first. So our Allison transmission over there. Um, if you recall on that Allison, if I can, right there, we actually had to go to neutral in between each gear shift and then shift gears and then move on. Well, these allow us to shift from one gear to the next without having to go to neutral. And the advantage to that is we can get a nice, uh, not necessarily smooth, but a nice consistent shift from one gear to the next without uh, worrying about the timing of that event. So for example, on the Allison, if we got the timing wrong, as we shifted from first gear to second gear, it's possible that we stay in neutral too long and the engine would rev up during that shift. Well, we don't want that. So on passenger car and light duty truck transmissions, they put in these devices to just automatically grab and move to the next gear rather than have to apply a different clutch uh, or whatever it may be to move to the next gear. It's just a mechan think of this as a mechanically applied clutch that will only lock up during acceleration. So when you decelerate, it'll just freewheel and rotate. So when you give, give it the throttle, it'll, it'll lock up and, and transfer power to the tires. When you let off on the throttle, it won't. But it also allows for a nice smooth shift or a nice timed consistent shift from one gear to the next. Uh, a Sprag is a pretty strong device, but it requires, it requires a whole bunch of lubrication to stay alive. And so uh, in big, heavy uh, transmissions like the Allison transmission, they typically have gone away from one-way devices because they typically don't hold up very well in heavy-duty applications. They end up breaking. 
Um, all right, this other one-way device right here is called a roller clutch. And it also has a race, this inner race here, that will rotate in one direction. Notice I can rotate the, the inside one direction, but not the other direction. This outer piece is splined right to the, the case of the transmission, so it does not rotate. So this inner piece will rotate. I need three hands to do this. Rotate in one direction, but not the other. Now if I push this one out of its housing, This one actually has little spring-loaded rollers. These are actually rollers, like in a ball bear, or not a ball bearing, a roller bearing. And they're just spring-loaded to one side. And inside of this uh, cage, and you can sort of see them uh, there, there, there's a ramp. If I take the rollers out, be very careful. There's the rollers, they're just round, and they're spring-loaded to one side. There's all of these little ramps that the rollers would have to roll up in one direction of rotation and roll down in the other. Well, when you want it to lock up, you make them roll up the ramp and it wedges the two races together. But when you want it to be able to rotate freely, you turn it the opposite direction and these rollers roll down the ramp and allow the um, inner race to rotate. So here's one of the rollers that fell out. Uh, already. Uh, those are almost impossible to put together backwards, uh, but still, if you ever take one apart, you need to uh, make sure that when you put it back together that it's rotating in the correct direction. All right, R roller clutches like this are not very strong, um, and so they end up being destroyed quite easily under heavy load and shock conditions. Uh, sprags are stronger, but they require a whole bunch of lubrication that the roller clutch uh, did not require near as much lubrication. Now there's one other type of uh, one-way device I want to uh, show you, and you're familiar with it already because you've used a um, ratchet from your toolbox uh, with a socket. Uh, this one-way uh, device acts just like a ratchet. So if we come over here to our 2018 Chevrolet Volt uh, plug-in hybrid uh, vehicle, the transmission out of it, and it's not a regular automatic transmission like we're learning about at the moment. We, we will come back later in the semester and learn about these. But it has, right down inside of here, a one-way device. But this one-way device is it acts like a ratchet. So I'm going to hold this piece from rotating and I'm going to rotate this electric motor and I hope you can hear the ratcheting. Let's try it. So it ratchets and rotates in one direction freely but if I try to rotate it the other direction then it wants to force uh, another part to rotate. So it'll freely rotate in one direction, locks up in the other direction, and that is still a one-way uh, device. So we've looked at a sprag, a roller clutch, and a ratchet. Uh, those are all one-way devices used in automatic transmissions. There are other types of one-way devices out there, but I have not seen them used in the automatic transmissions.